open your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 13 tonight. We officially cross halfway of 2 Kings tonight. 2 Kings chapter 13, if you need a Bible, if you need something to write with or something to write on, we got them for you. Just raise your hand for a moment. We'd love to provide. Just hold it up high up here in front, Anthony. We got one right here too. We got a winner. Oh, we got another one over here in the red shirt. Man in the red shirt. Just hold them up there. They'll get you. 2 Kings chapter 13. You know, I realize I mentioned this um, Sunday, but I'll just mention it again just to shout out to the Lord about our Beyond Sunday project last Saturday. I don't know if, if you were part of that, but remember we were doing the thing, uh, Help the Hungry Children, and basically raising money from our congregation to purchase food from a Christian organization called the Children's Hunger Fund to pack these food packs that hold about 20 pounds of food, and each food pack provides dinners for about a week for a family of five. Short story, our goal was 500, and last Saturday we packed 1,000 of them, which was really <laughs> amazing. All told, we probably had about 300 volunteers participate between Friday night and Saturday morning. And the cool thing was it was really fun. We all got together and did this, and, and these boxes are going out in Jesus' name, not only to provide food for people, but they're given through churches, and so the people from the churches all over the country and all over the world tell people about the Lord as they're giving this food, and we got to be a part of that. So I just want to thank you who participated or donated, and just praise the Lord for just another great, great outreach that we got, got to be a part of. It was really a blessing. So, so let me ask you this. Uh, just to start off with a mind-bending question tonight, okay? You ready? You awake? Okay, you better wake up. Here we go. Do you ever feel like you're kind of in a rut in your relationship with God? This is, I'll tell you when you raise your hand. This right now is just your own thinking. Do you ever wonder, I mean, is there more to having a relationship with the God of the universe than what I'm experiencing right now? I hope some of you are, because I, I, I wrestle with this. I've been a, a follower of Jesus for over 35 years now. And, you know, I've had my ups and downs, my hots and colds, my ons and offs. And, and I'm, I'm, man, I'm blessed and I'm excited, but I'm also at the point of wondering, is, is this all there is? I know that there's more. I know there's more. God is infinite, right? So we will never understand and experience and enjoy all of him. That's part of what eternity is all about, is spending eternity just getting to know who he is. Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, a lot of us have heard this, he said, I came that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And yet why is it, it seems like a lot of us, we're not, we're not feeling that, we're not experiencing that abundant life. Sometimes it can get just kind of routine and blasé. Something's wrong, right? I wanted to brainstorm for a little bit before we jump into the text tonight. What do people do or maybe not do? What do people do or maybe not do that causes them to miss out on all that God has for them? This is one where you can raise your hand now. What do people do or not do that causes them to miss out on all that God has for them? Yeah, Richard. They harden their heart. All right, good, good. Grant. We take our blessings from God for granted. Yes. Apologizing. Explain that to me. Oh, okay, not, not apologizing or not repenting. Okay, gotcha, yeah. When we sin and we don't repent, we don't get right with God. Very good. Yes, Linda. Oh, uh, yeah, that's along with that. Holding those secret sins in our heart that we haven't dealt with with God. Yeah, Bill. We let our, everything else in life take a fall. Yes, man, all the distractions, all the other things that just get our attention in our hearts. Yes, good one. Yeah, Bill. Ignoring the direction of the Holy Spirit, that still small voice, it's so easy to ignore. Yes? Yes, we try to do things in our own strength, in our own wisdom. Yes, Carol? Lack of prayer and meditation. Lack of prayer and meditation. Ooh, yeah, I'm going to share about that a little bit later myself personally. Yeah, John? We feel intimidated by the world around us. Yes, yes. 
We don't trust God that he is good and whatever he does will be for our good. Did you read my message already? Because that's some good stuff there, sister. One more? Anybody? Yes. We don't ask. Sometimes we just don't even ask. Yes. We could probably go on for a while, but the point is, the reason we're not experiencing more of God the reason we're not experiencing as much of God as we want, as is possible, is because of us, not because of Him, right? And tonight we're going to look at two kings, past kings of the nation of Israel, and see some big mistakes that they made that kept them, and not just them, but kept their people, their nation, from being blessed, from experiencing all that God had for them. And hopefully, we can learn from their mistakes. This is what wise people do so that we don't repeat them in our lives. So if you're taking notes, our subject tonight, bless you, is the errors of Jehoaz and Joash, kings of Israel. Those are the two we're going to look at. They always have these fun names. And our objective is that we would experience all that God has for us, all. Underline that, bold that, capitalize that. And before we jump into the text, I'd just like to invite you, let's, let's pray together tonight and ask our Heavenly Father to speak to us. God, we, we praise you for who you are. It is not by chance that we're in this room tonight to hear this message. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would give us ears to hear, humble hearts, open minds, and spirits, to let you speak into us what we need to hear Show us, Lord, tonight the things that are getting in the way of us knowing you more, experiencing more of you in our lives, growing in our faith and, and enjoying the blessings that you want to give us. God, show us. Help us to be changed. We just ask that you would do this to your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to bite off this in two chunks tonight. We're going to read uh, chapter 13, verses 1 to 13, and the first thing we're going to see, one of the mistakes, is repeating sinful patterns. Look with me at 2 Kings chapter 13 and verse 1. In the 23rd year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, became king over Israel in Samaria and reigned 17 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And follow the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made Israel sin. He did not depart from them. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he delivered them into the hand of Hazael, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, all their days. So Jehoahaz pleaded with the Lord, and the Lord listened to him, for he saw the oppression of Israel because the king of Syria, Syria, the king of Syria, <laughs> whoops, the king of Syria oppressed them. That's funny. Then the Lord gave Israel a deliverer, so that they escaped from under the hand of the Syrians. I'm never going to forget that now. Sorry. And the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before. Nevertheless, they did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who had made Israel sin, but walked in them. And the wooden image also remained in Samaria. Verse 7, For he left of the army of Jehoahaz only fifty horsemen, ten chariots, and ten thousand foot soldiers. For the king of Syria had destroyed them and made them like the dust at threshing. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoahaz, all that he did in his might, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Jehoahaz rested with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria. Then Joash, his son, reigned in his place. Keep going on verse 10. In the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, don't you love that, became king over Israel and Samaria and reigned 16 years. Verse 11, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin but walked in them. Now the rest of the acts of Joash, all that he did, and all in his might with which he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? 
So Joash rested with his fathers. Then Jeroboam sat on his throne, and Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. Let's just stop right there. Again, the first big mistake we see is this repeating of sinful patterns. And we see in verse 1, there's a new king in Israel. Last chapter, last week, again, we were focused back on the southern king of Judah, the southern kingdom of Judah. It keeps jumping back and forth. And so this beginning of first, verse 1, it says, it talks about Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, southern kingdom. And during that time, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, became the king over Israel, the northern kingdom. So tonight we're focusing on Israel again, okay, the northern kingdom. Jehoahaz is the new king. And it says in verse 2, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Does that phrase sound familiar to you? If you've been coming on Wednesday nights for a while, you've heard that expression a lot. I did a little search today. And just in First and Second Kings, what we've been studying here, that phrase comes up 18 times. And you know that's not all of them. Over and over and over again, the same thing. And it says, again, this phrase, it followed the sins of Jeroboam. Remember, Jeroboam was the first king of the northern kingdom, Israel, and he made these two golden calves, remember this, and set them up as gods. That's what they're talking about here. This, this idolatrous worship of these golden calves, it's so silly. And he did not depart from them. He kept repeating the sins of his predecessors. And so we see in verse 3, we're not surprised then. The anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. And he delivered them into the hand of Hazael, king of Syria. So God gets mad. He gets angry. He's tired of this. But we always have to realize when the Lord is angry, he's also still loving. Right? He's angry because his children, his chosen people, are getting pulled away from him again and worshiping idols turning their backs to him, the one who loved them, the one who created them. This angers him. And so what does he do? He turns them over. He delivers them to the Syrians, their enemies. And you know, there's a lesson in here for us, and I know we know it, but we need to be reminded of it. There are consequences to our sin. (laughs) Whenever we choose a path that is not what God wants, there are consequences. And many times, because God is such a good, loving, perfect, heavenly Father, He allows us as His children to suffer the consequences of our bad choices so that we will learn our lessons and turn our hearts back to Him. Didn't you do that as a parent with your kids? I hope so. I remember that. My kids are bigger than me now. I can't do anything. But when they were little, it was painful to me, but sometimes I let them suffer the consequences of their choices so they would learn not to do it again, right? And so they'd come back to me and realize, hey, maybe Dad had something to say here. God does the same thing. But we see in verse 4, this guy Jehoah has. Now he's, you know, he's leading the country badly. He's this idolatrous worshiper. But things get so bad, what does he do? He pleads with the Lord. He finally turns to the true and living God. And this word plead, it's an interesting Hebrew word. It means to be sick, to be weak and diseased, to be grieved, to be sorry. He's just this broken down person, finally coming back to the one true God to plead. God, help us. Our enemies, the Syrians, are destroying us. And it seems like, if you just stick with that part of the verse there, that he's really truly repentant. Unfortunately, as we're going to see in a minute, it's just temporary. And there's something to remember, and this is is interesting. True repentance means there's going to be a change in direction. That's what repentance means. A change in heart that leads to a change in direction. And I say true repentance because there's a repentance that looks like true repentance, but it's not. What that is, is that I'm sorry things are so bad, I'm sorry I'm suffering so much right now, but it's not I'm sorry that I've sinned against you, Lord. I came across a quote from Spurgeon. Whenever you can quote Spurgeon, it's really cool. All right, Charles Spurgeon, great. So this is cool. He repented because of the suffering and not because of the sin. He returned to the sin after escaping the sorrow. That's his false repentance. I see this sometimes in counseling. 
People come in and they confess various sins and they seem like they're sorry, but there's something missing there. And what it is, is they're sorry that they got caught, they're sorry that they're suffering, they're sorry they're having to go through all this hassle, but they're not really sorry for their sin. And that's what we see with Jehoahaz, this pseudo-repentance. But God in His mercy, as we continue in verse 5, the Lord gave Israel a deliverer, even though we're going to see this was not true repentance. God still sent a deliverer to rescue Israel. Nobody knows exactly who this deliverer is. Some people think that God allowed the Assyrians, another nation, to come and attack the Syrians, and they had to turn their attention toward them and all their resources, and that stopped the Syrians from attacking the Israelites. Maybe. Some people think the deliverers were Elisha, the prophet. Some people think it was one of the kings coming up we're going to talk about. Nobody knows for sure. Not mentioned, must not be that important. The important thing is that God sent somebody to rescue his people. And he didn't do it because of the true repentance of Jehoahaz. He did it because, as we see over in verse 23 later, God was faithful to his covenant with his people. He's faithful to his promises. He's not going to let his people be destroyed. Even though they deserve it, he's not going to because of his faithfulness. That's, that's who God is. And it says at the end of verse 5, the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before. When things are safe, when they're secure, people can live outside the city in their tents. When they're under attack, when things are not safe and it's dangerous, everybody has to pull inside the city. But God delivered them and so it was safe to go back out in the tents again. I like that. And then we see, verse 6, nevertheless, doesn't it bug you? Nevertheless, I'm not a real patient person, so it's a good thing I'm not God. Nevertheless, they did not depart from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who had made Israel sin, but walked in them. And the wooden image also remained in Samaria. After God delivers them, they still don't truly repent and turn from their wicked, evil, idolatrous ways back to the true God. The same pattern. And this wooden image, we talked about this in previous chapters, it was like this long wooden pole that was supposed to represent this Canaanite goddess Asherah. It was associated with Baal worship. And we know, you know, this evil, sick worship. They left this thing there. It was actually set up by King Ahab, remember Israel's most evil king a long time ago. It's still there. Still there. But consequences in verse 7, he left of the army of Jehoahaz. 50 horsemen, 10 chariots, and 10,000 foot soldiers. That's nothing. Basically, their army is now decimated. Another example of sin leads to consequences. He rescued them, but he let them experience the consequences. And so we see a pattern here. Do you see it? There's sin. Whatever it is, idolatry, whatever it is, there's a sinful sinfulness, and then God allows the consequences of sin, suffering, whatever it might be, an invading army, whatever it might be, and then things get so bad that finally people remember God and turn to Him and ask Him for help, and then God in His mercy comes and He rescues them, relieves the problem, takes away the suffering, they're good for a while, and then they turn back to their sin. That's a pattern. If you read the book of Judges, you see that pattern over and over and over and over and over again. That's a bad pattern. And as we read verses 10 and 11, it happens again. Jehoahaz became, let's see, in the 37th, uh, there's a new king. Jehoahaz became king over Israel and Samaria. And he reigned, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, did not depart from the sin. So it's, it's the pattern just keeps happening over and over Think about your life for a minute, your life. Do you see something like this in your own life? Sin, suffering, repentance, easing of suffering, falling back into sin? Maybe your sin is something different. It's going to be different for all of us. For us to experience all of who he is, all he wants 
to be in our lives, for us to have the kind of relationship with God that we want, we've got to break this pattern. We've got to get out of this. We've got to deal with our sin. Because as long as we stay in it, it's just a block. It limits. How do we break these patterns? How do we break these patterns of sin that we all struggle with in our lives? There's one real word, not to oversimplify, but there's one word for it, and it's repentance. But I'm talking about the real repentance, not the kind that I'm so sorry that I'm suffering right now. I'm so sorry that I hurt other people around me. It's that I'm so sorry that I've sinned against you, God. I confess and admit what I am doing is sin against you. And I don't want to do it anymore. I want to go in a new direction. Help me. Change me. Heal me. Forgive me. Please. That's, that's real repentance. And it sounds so simple, but that's the key. True repentance before God. God. That's what's going to change us. And the one through whom we are forgiven is Jesus. It all comes back to Him. We have to repent in Jesus' name. Listen, I just read this this morning, so I want to include this. At the very beginning of His ministry, Jesus goes back home to Nazareth. Nazareth. And he stands up in the synagogue to hand him the scroll of Isaiah because he's a visiting rabbi and he gets to read. And he opens it to um, Isaiah and he reads this passage. And I want to read to you. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus reads this and he closes up and he says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, he's saying, I am the man. This was written about me, and I am here to do these things, to set you free, to open your eyes, to heal you. This is why it's all about Jesus, because he's the one. He's the one who's going to be able to change us through his spirit who lives in us as we repent, truly repent of our sins. And we've got to seek him first. And he says we need to seek him with all of our hearts. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. This is the answer. Seeking Jesus first and truly repenting of our sins. When we do that, he will come in. And do you believe that Jesus can change people's hearts? A lot of us have experienced that. We're still in process. But he's in the business of changing people's hearts and minds and lives. And so if you're here tonight and you're struggling with some pattern of sin, whatever it might be, you don't have to. And I'm not saying God's going to wave a magic wand. It's going to happen immediately, but it's going to start with you turning to Jesus and truly, truly repenting of your sin and asking him to change you. That's the big mistake that they made here. They just kept repeating this pattern of sin over and over and over, and we see what happened. And that keeps us from experiencing all of who God is and all he has for our lives. But that's not the only thing. Let's look at the next thing we see. The next thing we see, the next big mistake, is a lack of faith. And this is a really interesting story. We've got to check this out. Look at verse 14. We'll read 14 through 25 now. Verse 14, Elisha had become sick with the illness of which he would die. Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. Then he said to the king of Israel, Put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it. And Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. 
And he said, open the east window. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For you must strike the Syrians at Aphek until you have destroyed them. Then he said, take the arrows. So he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, strike the ground. So he struck three times and stopped. Verse 19, and the man of God was angry with him and said, you should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. Then Elisha died and they buried him. And the raiding bands from Moab invaded the land in the spring of the year. Verse 21, so it was, check this out, as they were burying a man that suddenly they spied a band of raiders and they put the man in the tomb of Elisha and when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood on his feet. We'll talk about that. Verse 22, and Hazael, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz, but the Lord was gracious to them had compassion on them and regarded them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and would not destroy them or cast them from his presence. Now Hazael, king of Syria, died. Then Ben-Hadad, his son, reigned in his place. And and Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, recaptured recaptured from the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, the cities which he had taken out of the hand of Jehoahaz, his father, by war. Three times Joash defeated him and recaptured the cities of Israel. Let's just break this down. And again, we're going to see this this big mistake that you can summarize as a lack of faith. So we read about Elisha. We haven't talked about Elisha for quite a while. It's like, what what was happening with him? Well, he just was there. There was like a 45-year gap where he was there ministering and serving the Lord that we don't really hear much about him. Which is kind of weird because at the beginning, you know, he's doing all these miracles and all these amazing things. But here he is, this great prophet of the Lord. And it says, Joash, the king of Israel. We just talked about Joash's death, but obviously this happened before he died, okay? And so Joash goes down to see Elisha. He hears he's dying. And he says, oh, my father, my father. It's not his literal father. That's just a title of respect. Everybody, even if they didn't believe in the one true God or follow him, they respected Elisha, the man of God, God's prophet. And he calls him, he says this phrase here, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. Does that sound familiar? Write this down. Chapter 2 and verse 12. Chapter 2 and verse 12, that same expression is used when Elijah, Elisha's mentor, when Elijah was taken up into heaven, Elisha said those same words to Elijah. And now here it is, this king saying it to Elisha. It's just interesting. And what that means is they recognize that God is the protector of Israel and he works through his man, his prophet. He's their chariot. He's their horseman. It's an acknowledgement of the power of God working through his prophet. So Elijah, Elisha, now I'm going to get mixed up on that all. Elisha tells King Joash to go get a bow and arrows, which he does. He tells him, you know, put your hand on it and string it out. And then Elisha, this old man on his deathbed, he puts his hands on top of the hands of the king. And then he says, open the east window. The window facing east, that's where the Syrians were, the land that the Syrians had invaded. It's that direction. And he says, shoot an arrow out the window. Boom, out goes this arrow. And this wasn't an uncommon thing. A lot of times back in this time, when wars were going to begin, the country starting the war would actually shoot an arrow in the direction of the country they were going to invade. And so Elisha direct Joash, the king, to do this as a symbolic act that you are going to go and fight these people, but God is going to be with you. That's why he put his, his, put his hands on the bow. God is going to be with you and give you the strength and guide you. And it's a wonderful picture of a promise, of prophecy, of an assurance that God's going to give his people victory. In fact, he calls it the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. God was going to deliver them from their enemies. But then we get to verse 18, and it gets really interesting. He says, take some more arrows and strike the ground. And we don't know if he means strike them. Some people I read shoot the arrows into the ground, right? We don't know which it was. So he does three of them, and then he stops. Three seems pretty good. But Elisha's ticked off. 
He's really upset that King Joash stopped after three. He's like, why did you stop? If he would have done five or six, that would have been enough times, enough victories over Syria to wipe them out forever, but you stopped. Now you're only going to have three victories, but they're still going to be here. Your enemy is not going to be destroyed. And obviously by the reaction of Elisha, Joash should have known this. He didn't do what he knew he should have done. So what's that all about? That's all about Joash lacking faith. Lacking faith in the true God. And really believing that if he did it, that God would come through and deliver them from their enemies and destroy their enemies. He was demonstrating what was really in his heart, which was really a lack of faith in God. And it not only had a bad effect on him, but he's, remember, he's the king of this whole nation. And his bad choice and lack of faith is going to affect all his people in his country. His lack of faith led to partial obedience, which in turn led to partial blessing. It's because he wasn't completely surrendered to the Lord. His commitment was half-hearted. And so he missed out. God had this plan. God would have wiped them out, the Syrians. But because of Joash's lack of faith, they were going to still be around and continue to attack his people. And you guys, this is why, this is the second reason why so many of us were missing out on all that God has for us. It's because of our lack of faith. I'm not saying that we don't believe in Jesus as our Savior. Of course we do. But that's just the first step. Then you've got to go out and live in this world, right? And deal with all the trials and tribulations. And that's where it gets hard sometimes. And we trust Him partway for things. We put our confidence in Him to, to a certain degree, but not totally. For some things and not for others. Not completely. We trust Him for a certain part and the rest of it we try and take care of ourselves. Or we put our confidence in someone or something else. And we're lacking this total abandonment of faith that God is who He is and will do what He says He will do. And we can trust Him completely. Remember what Jesus said? Two blind guys came up and asked Him to heal them. This is in uh, Matthew chapter 9. And Jesus said, according to your faith, let it be to you. And they must have had a lot of faith because they went away and they saw. Our limited faith results in temporary victories over sin and limited blessings from God. And instead of completely trusting Him about everything, we try to figure out things for ourselves We try to control things. I'm speaking for myself here, and I assume you can resonate with some of this. (laughs) Out of fear, we don't fully step out and obey everything he asks us to do. We have contingency plans. (laughs) We only partially obey him, and therefore we only partially experience all that he has for us. So again, think about your life for a minute where you are. About what are you struggling to have faith in the Lord right now? I'll bet we all have something. Something in your life that you're really just struggling to completely trust God about. Maybe it's your marriage or one of your kids or maybe it's money or a job or career. Or maybe it's something with your health. Maybe it's just your future. You know, these are the big things of life that test our faith. And these are the things where we can really see that we're trusting God partway, but we're still holding on. And and to the degree that we're holding on is the degree that we're missing out on who He is and what He wants to do in us and through us. 
There's a lack of faith there. And we've got to understand, and I know we know it, but Jesus is completely trustworthy. He told us, John 14, when he told us to believe in him. He said, you believe in God, believe also in me. Believe in me. And the more that we are willing to step out in faith, and it gets scary, but the more we're willing to step out in faith and really trust him, the more we're going to experience him working, the more we're going to experience his faithfulness in our lives and his blessings. What a blessing it is to get to know God more and understand on even deeper levels how trustworthy and loving and awesome he is. This is the other big reason that we're, we're missing out, lack of faith. In verse 20, we see that Elisha dies, great man of God, and they bury him. He's probably around 70 years old, they estimate. Great prophet, you know, it's estimated he did twice as many miracles as Elijah. And in fact, we see in verse 21 something so bizarre, he actually God does a miracle through Elisha even after he's dead. So one day, these guys are burying a fallen comrade, and some, a band of raiders comes, and, and just because they've got to get out of there quick, they open up Elisha's tomb and throw this guy in the tomb. And as soon as he touches the bones of Elisha, he comes back to life. Isn't that bizarre? You know why that happened? One, because it's a cool story. But two, it was God's way of telling the king and his people that this prophecy that was made through Elisha was going to come true. Elisha the prophet was dead. God, the one who does the miracles, is still alive. I just thought that's such a bizarre thing. God did it to to motivate and, and stimulate the faith of Joash and the Israelites. And then we see in verse 23, I love this verse here, but the Lord, in spite of all this sin and stuff, but the Lord was gracious to them, had compassion on them, and regarded them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not destroy them or cast them from his presence. Even though we're still so sinful, just like the Israelites, God is still faithful. And, and we see some reasons in this verse of why we know we can trust the Lord, why we can put our faith in Him. One, because He's gracious. That means He's full of grace. Remember, grace is undeserved favor. The favor that God gives us, we don't deserve anyway. And He's full of grace toward us. That's who He is. And it says He's compassionate. He's full of mercy. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. We deserve consequences all the time, but God in His mercy doesn't give them to us because that's who He is. And it says He regards them. That means He pays attention. He turns towards them. It's because God knows what's going on. God knows what's going on in your life, and He cares about it. That's why we can put our faith in Him. And also we see that God is faithful. He's faithful to His covenant. He's faithful to His promises. He's gracious, compassionate, he cares, and he's faithful. That's just some of who God is. And the more we understand that, the more we're able to put our faith in him and be willing to step out in those areas that we're afraid. And then in verse 25, we see the prophecy was fulfilled. Joash defeated the Syrians three times, but they were not destroyed. So they stayed an enemy of Israel, warring, killing, raiding. Because of Joash's limited faith, he recaptured lost cities, but he didn't destroy Syria. He didn't destroy the enemy. And that's really what we're looking to do in our lives is destroy this enemy of sin. We're never going to be totally sinless in this lifetime. I mean, let's just be real about it. But we don't have to have the same battles over and over. We can go on to new battles and deal with new sins.
Joash's lack of faith and obedience and commitment not only affected him, but all those people. And that's what happens with sin. When we sin, it's not just affecting us, it's affecting people around us. That's a good thing to remember when we're dealing with temptation. So those are two big things, two big mistakes that these kings make. Repeating this pattern of sin over and over and over and having a severe lack of faith. And those two things really keep them and the people from experiencing all that God has for them and all that he wants to do for his people. So I ask you tonight, are you content with where your relationship with God is? I'm not. I want more. I'm afraid to say that, but I want more. I know there's more to God. There's more that I have to grow and learn and be. Would you like to experience more of what God has for you? It's up to us. He doesn't force himself. If you're kind of happy where you are, he's going to leave you there. Well, actually, he may not. He may still work in your life in some ways to get your attention. Are you ready to try and break some of these sinful habits you've got going on in your life? And maybe you've tried, I'm sure some of you have tried and tried and tried. Well, hopefully this is a revelation tonight. It starts with repenting, true, true repentance. And really coming to Jesus and asking Him to work in you. The key to our, our faith, the key to our freedom is faith in Jesus. Jesus said, He who the Son sets free is free indeed. He is the key. It's not about coming to church. It's not about learning your Bible. It's not about serving or giving or saying the right things. It's about a relationship with Jesus. He's the one who lives in us through his Holy Spirit who can change us because we can't change ourselves. So what, what do you need to do? Remember I asked this question at the beginning. Now it's time to make it personal. What do you need to do or stop doing in order to take that next step in your relationship with the Lord? What do you need to do or stop doing that will help you take that next step to experience more of God working in your life? I hope you come up with an answer in your head right now. And you can take it home and you can wrestle with God about it. For me, I was thinking about this. For me, of course, this is the joy of teaching as you get to learn more than anybody else. It was, I was actually mad at myself. It seems so obvious. I'm like, what do I really need to do to grow more? I don't know what to... For me, it's pretty simple. I need to learn how to slow down more and be still and really spend more time just praying and listening to God. I know a lot of us like, we just go, 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 go. If I'm not getting something done, if I can't cross something off my list, it feels like a waste of time. And that goes, that's directly in opposition to Psalm 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. And I really know, if I spend more time praying to God, am I going to experience more of God in my life? Yeah, I know I am. I've experienced some of that before. So what is it for you? Whatever it is, I want to challenge you tonight. Bring it before God and ask Him to help you. Whether it's something you need to add or something you need to take away. If you want more of God in your life, which I hope that you do. He wants to be more a part of our lives. Just like my kids are married now and out of the house, I want to be more a part of their lives. <laughs> If they call and say, hey, you want to get together for dinner, I'll cancel anything. And I'm not as bad as my wife. That's how bad God wants us to be in his life and he wants to be in our life even more than that. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for tonight. I pray that you'd be working in each of us through your Holy Spirit and just convicting us, Lord, of our sin of things maybe we need to be doing to, 
to invest more in our relationship with you, to get to know you more, to experience more of you, and also things maybe we need to cut out of our lives, God, that are getting in the way. Whatever it is, I just pray for each of us that you would give us the motivation to do it. Through your Spirit, give us the discipline, the courage, the faith that we need to step out and do it because we want to know you more, Lord. We want more of you in our lives. We need more of you in our lives. You are life. Help us to remember this and to believe it, Lord. Just thank you that your gracious, loving, merciful God who's constantly drawing us to yourself. We give you praise for that. Thank you for tonight, Lord. Please let your will be done in our lives. To the glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen.